Hey, GovCon Giants, your host, Eric Coffey, bringing you another exciting episode of the GovCon Giants podcast. Today's guest, Marsha Lindquist. She is the pricing expert. I know that a few weeks ago we brought on someone else to discuss pricing. However, today we have a special guest because why pricing when it comes to doing government contracts is just as important as the proposal. And a lot of times they go hand in hand. So we're going to have Marsha on today discussing pricing government contracts. She's been doing for the past 30 years, starting her career with Bechtel, a one of the largest actual government contracting businesses in the world. And so again, she learned pricing from an early age and she's been teaching it and helping small businesses win at the pricing game. By the way, Marsha has a brand new book out on pricing. It's on Amazon. We'll make sure to link that in the show notes today as well. So stay tuned for this upcoming episode with Marsha Lindquist. All right, Marsha, go ahead and introduce yourself and the name of your company. Um, Marsha Lindquist, uh, president of Granite Leadership Strategies. And Marsha, we're so happy to have you on today, the GovCon Giants podcast. Welcome. Thank you so very much. I've been looking forward to this immensely. Oh, that's great. That's excellent. And, you know, I'm always happy to meet fellow experts in the space because, you know, uh, I'm newly uh, a teacher and a trainer to government contracting. Uh, I've been in the field working kind of in a, in my own box uh, in a silo for a long time. And so <laughs> now that I'm publicly out and uh, sharing my story, my journey, and the journeys of others, the plight, I love meeting all of you out here who have been adding so much value to the community and the ecosystem for so many years that uh, I'm always excited to learn something new. So I, I I look forward to it. And I bet you you're going to teach me a lot of stuff that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Uh, I often think that what I've got to teach everybody knows. You know, you know? I, I, I was funny you said that. I think the same way. I felt the same. I go, everyone knows this stuff already. So, um, no, that's exciting. Well, I see, first of all, we have a lot of mutual connections. Yes, we do. You know? and, and, and they're great people. You know, right. no, I have right. to say this. This is the Certainly. crazy thing about this community. The GovCon community, while it's huge, is pretty tight. It's pretty small. It is. You know, you know what I mean? It there is. are p- people who know people. Right. 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 And it's it, it, it amazes me. I've been doing this several decades and I'm amazed at the number of people who know people that, you know. Right. right. That's right. the good thing. And it feels like it's family. You know? And that's what we were talking about, right? Just before we got started on the call today, right? We were just right. We were exchanging people that we knew and mutual connections right. and things like that. So, no, I agree with you. Um, I love coming to the DC Beltway because you're right. I, 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 I'm always greeted with open arms and hugs from yes. the people, and so that's right. always very comforting and warm and inviting. It, it is. I'm getting to take my first trip to DC in three years in October. And yeah, and and I'm looking forward to seeing people I haven't seen in three years. And that's and it's going to be it's going to be an awesome rock rocking trip. So, Marsha, tell us a little bit, uh, you know, about your background and and how did you get into the world of government contracting? And, you know, (laughs) what is your area of expertise? So I got started in gov, really government contracting. I want to say in 1981 and 1982, I was working for Bechtel Power Corporation in 1981, and they won a a government contract to clean up Three Mile Island. And I was the cost engineer on Three Mile Island at the time. Okay. Then I moved over to um, McDonnell Douglas in 1982, and I was fortunate enough to work for Uh, a great division of McDonnell Douglas as a pricing specialist. That was the first thing that I did there. And I loved it. I I, I had no idea really how to price government contracts. I knew very little about it. I did some of it, but not very much. And I cut my teeth at a big company, really, at both big companies. Sure. So uh, the great thing about working for a big company is that you don't stay in one position. You know, so I got to move from pricing to accounting to contracts and back to pricing again. So I got the rounds, 
so to speak. Oh, nice. No, and, yeah. I, and I'm sure that that, you know, all of those experiences is what essentially led you to where you're at today. Yeah, it just, it shapes me. People say, well, if you had to pick one of the three as your, you know, favorite specialties, what would it be? And I, I'd have a hard time, but I do love strategic pricing a lot. Okay. Now tell me, you said uh, you worked as the cost engineer. What is that? Well, that's a uh, that's a, a an engineering construction firm's way of saying that you work with the numbers, you work with estimating, you work with with taking the estimates from the functional area and turning them into and, and the scheduling, and you turn them into estimates of what it takes to finish whatever project you're on. So you are effectively doing pricing. Interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. It's 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 one way of looking at it, but right. you're working with estimates. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, uh, like you said, so since that time, I know you've done been director of contracts and pricing at different right. companies. I mean, that's, that's been your corporate controller, director of contracts. <laughs> right. That's my jam. That's your that's jam, it. right? You know? and, and, and it's very hard when you're doing pricing, it's very hard not to touch the, uh, accounting parts of life mm -hmm. and it's very hard not to touch the contracts part of life so that's why when someone comes to me with pricing it may not be simply pricing that they're going to be touching right that will be touching mm -hmm. it may be all of it i never know i never know you know once i start working with somebody it could become more complex than just pricing so what are some of the challenges? I mean, you know, I would, I, I you know, I was just on the call recent, like, I mean, maybe two hours ago with a large construction company on the West Coast and they do tilt wall construction. They do some civil construction. Uh, they've never done work for the government. What do you anticipate would be some of their challenges they would have with pricing when it comes to the government and they've never done it before? Well, see, and that's that's something that we, we are seeing more and more because companies are looking to get more into the government space, right. whether they're small or large. Sure. And what they don't know is that uh, the government has their own way quote, of, of seeing pricing, okay? The government is very used to seeing pricing in a cost plus type approach, whether mm -hmm. they're bidding fixed price or you're bidding time and materials or whatever it happens to be. But if a company's coming at it as a commercial customer and they're doing that's all that they've done, there's certainly nothing wrong with them presenting their pricing in a commercial way of thinking. OK, sure. so if they are used to that and can present it that way uh, and the government is willing to to listen and be receptive to that, they don't have to do anything different as long as they're not bidding cost plus work. If they're bidding cost plus work, the whole combination of things changes dramatically because mm. it's a very cost-based mentality. But I have seen, for example, I'm working on one right now that's a fixed price contract. The government is asking for all kinds of data as if it were time and materials. Mm. And, you know, and, and, and really they're looking at some of the cost plus parts. So that's what contractors are not used to seeing when they move from commercial to government. They're not used to seeing the way government tends to look at things in a pricing perspective. That's, that's, can, we, can we, for the folks that are more in the, uh, I, where you, you know, I, I tend to myself throw around a lot of acronyms. Acronyms, right. Yeah, and I know you do because you have that experience, right? It's right. So Let's kind of, I try let's to be, pull it back. Yes, pull it back. So let's, let's, back. let's discuss some of the things that we are, we're, we've broken down. So okay. again, use cost plus. Can you explain cost plus and can you sure. explain PM? Okay. So cost plus is, is typically cost plus some kind of a fee arrangement. It could be cost plus fixed fee, award fee, whatever incentive fee, whatever it happens to be. Cost plus meaning the government wants to see all the, the, uh, the detail of all of the different elements of cost, what mm -hmm. your cost is uh, for a project. 
Uh, and then you get to put on your indirect rates. We'll get that's another thing entirely, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you get to put some profit on it. But they're right. very, very focused on what your cost basis is, okay? Right. Time and materials means that we've got the government would pay you for, for the time it takes to do something. In other words, you're uh, fully loaded, burdened, wrapped, let's see, plussed up. I'm trying to use all the words, the buzzwords <laughs> that you would add to your labor, okay? All the adders that you would add to your labor. In other words, what are, what is your cost of labor plus what does it take for those indirect rates we were talking about on time and then materials, materials being separate. But a lot of times when they talk, the government talks about materials, they're talking not just of the cost of those materials, but what other adders you may put onto it as well. Okay. Profit always gets applied to time. Sometimes, especially in the DOD world, profit does not get applied to materials. Okay. So that's a short synopsis of time and materials. I have to admit, I talk about some of that in, in the book on okay. uh, secrets of strategic pricing for government contractors, but that kind of information too is available uh, out in the marketplace right. for what the sure. definition no, is. I, no, and what, we, what I'd like to do with the time that we have together is for you to try to help people understand. And, and I like to educate and inform yeah. because some, you know, we get in, we, it's very, my experiences have taught me, Marsh, uh, of being a public person in the space that uh, I find myself countering a lot of the, hey, the government buys a gazillion dollars, just jump in. So I find right. myself having to, to pull people back and say they do buy a gazillion dollars. However, you have to follow the processes. You got to follow compliance. You got to find regulatory issues. And and so uh, while yes, there is uh, on the other end of the rainbow, there is a pot of gold. There's a there's a huge rainbow <laughs> that you have to go up and down. It's, and <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. It's pretty of a big. rainbow. Right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. No, People think that it's easy money, right? Right. right. Okay. And it's not easy money. Okay. Oh so, uh, yes. So, and getting into government contracting is not for somebody who just wants well, to add an, an, right. another customer. Okay. Right, right. So I, so I, I want. So the, with that said, I like to uh, educate, inform, and sort of uh, let them have expectations of what they're going to be uh, dealing with and in stepping into this the space. Gotcha. Now, when you said, okay, we discussed fixed price with the fixed price contracts. Are there certain contract types that the government favors using fixed price over TNM over cost plus? Well, I'm seeing a lot more in the last probably 20 years. It's been a while um, that I'm seeing the turn, the tide turning more to fixed price than I ever have before. From where? That seems, from, from, from cost plus okay. or even from T&M. Okay. Uh, and I think that's, that's coming largely as a result of a few things, my conjecture, okay, and my exposure to this. One is that we have and this is not a dig on contracting officers. It's just that we've had to add so many into the government workforce, okay, that we've had to make it simpler. People are, are pushing for things to happen quicker. People are, are, are pushing for things to be simpler. So when that happens, if you go to fixed price, then all you're really dealing with, if you're talking about price now, right, mm -hmm. is you're talking about this price versus that price versus that price. It's simply you know, what is the bottom price, you know, point, right? As opposed to cost plus in which they've got to get in and analyze a bunch of things takes longer, right? Is much harder for co government contractors to implement cost plus, uh, takes more of their own resources. It's just, it's time consuming, right? Oh. It's quicker to go fix price. Now, t &M, kind of a shortcut, but there is a cost plus element to time and materials. There's the materials part of it, which does really get into the nitty gritty to some degree of those costs. So does the time, you know? So fixed price is simpler. It's quicker. That's why the government likes it. Okay. No, again, you have that, you have that experience that I do not possess. Um, okay. 
the when it comes to services, um, are you finding that services are still are fixed price? Or are you finding services are cost plus? Or oh my expensive? god, I'm seeing it all over the map. Really? Okay. So there's no yeah. there's no no one way. No, but I still am seeing that there is more fixed price even for services than I ever have before. You know, uh, it's kind of uh, how could I say this? It's it's really up the the risk is being put back onto the contractors and away from the government. In right. the cost plus environment, the government has a bigger share of risk than the contractor does. So in a fixed price environment, we see way more risk being borne by the contractor. You know, so that's why we're seeing some of that tide change. Have you ever seen uh, a contractor when they go to the government change from being a fixed price to maybe a cost plus or a TNM contract? Have you had that experience? I've not. Well, let me say this. I, I don't see that often, although I have seen it. OK, okay. Uh, I, I it, it's not usual. Usually when something is a fixed price, boy, the government loves it because there's less audit. It's quicker closeout. There's a lot of good reasons why the government favors it. OK, but I have seen contracts that if you have a follow on contract, it may have been fixed price before and now it could be cost plus. I've seen that happen. Yeah, I've seen on my side those contracts and I saw it with a specific type of IDIQ. I can't think of it now, but they used means pricing plus a percentage factors. Interesting. Wow. I thought I'd seen it all, but I'd not seen that. Okay. You know, uh, well, what do you think now? What's What do you think should be happening now, given uh, inflation and price rising? What do you think? What do you think is a solution to that? Oh, my God. Uh, I, mean, how I, can we, just... I mean, I've I've been on some uh, calls, at least my team has, with the Corps of Engineers, and they're trying to figure out uh, how do you hold pricing? And or how do you because the government doesn't allow us to have uh, contingencies, at least not the federal level. So no. how do you hold pricing or how do you account for pricing adjustments that are happening 30, 60, 90 days out? I know. Um, here, here's what I want to say. This is a huge mixed bag right now. OK, now in the DOD environment, you can go back to your government customer and request an equitable price adjustment. OK. OK, that is possible. Now, is it easy? Heck no. OK, if it was so easy, everybody would do it. But we're seeing huge amounts of, uh, of changes in salary levels right now. Right. We're seeing supply chain issues. So products are costing more and contractors are having a hard time figuring all of that into their price to to, you know, to put forth to the government. And let's combine that with the mentality that's in the government right now. The government let's say economic buyer has not been as in touch with the inflation changes as we as contractors would like them to be in touch with. They are still thinking salary levels are going to go up at 2.5% a year. Surprise, it's closer to 5% in the last year. So are we seeing that change? We might but it's going to take a while for that to change. Now, what are contractors supposed to do? The bottom line of it is, I don't know the answer to that. It's going to depend upon what we see as the, uh, the government customer being receptive to higher inflation to protect the contractor. Again, back to, is it fixed price or is it cost plus? If it's cost plus, don't worry about it. If it's fixed price, you'd better be planning ahead because you could get, shall I say, bitten, back to your shark picture there, you could get bitten by the shark called inflation and or supply chain issues or the inability to hire people. I mean, I just spent time on, on a webinar this morning. We've got 11 million outstanding open jobs in this country and only 6 million people are looking. That's a huge differential. So what is that going to do? It's going to push salary levels up. Right. So, I mean, pricing on government contracting is going to be an incredible uh, challenge in the next 10 years. So, so tell me, 
uh, your company, Granite Leadership Strategies. Tell me how you guys can help. Well, most of what we do is we work with, with our clients to put some wisdom into that pricing that they've okay. got to do. Uh, the best way to do that is to start as soon as people know they're going to go bid something. Hopefully that's not when the RFP comes out. <laughs> Hopefully that's before the RFP comes out. You shouldn't be sitting there waiting for RFPs to decide to bid. You should be following what's going on and know ahead of time. Because, oh, and I was just talking about this this morning with someone else. You've got to know the things that impact your pricing don't get done overnight. It's not like, oh, let's spend all this time on the technical solution. And oh, by the way, here's a day or two to go and let's get the pricing done. That's, it's not commercial world at all. It's very, very different. And in the book, I talk about the things that you can be doing. There are over two dozen pricing strategies at your disposal to really get at the pricing that's best for that bid. And you're not going to do that once the RFPs come out. Nice. Uh, can you give us some examples of, of one of those things that you could do? Yeah, absolutely. So you could... For example, if you're going to be going into a new area and need a new facility, you would want to take a look at what it takes to actually rent that facility because that's going to be part of your cost. You right. need to know what that is in order to, to bid that correctly. Another one, oh my God, the one that we just talked about, escalation. You've really got to do some homework about that right now because that is fluctuating like crazy. So you'd want to get some important studies done both from the government and commercially of what escalation is going to do to your pricing, right? right. Or you want to, the other thing that you're going to want to do is you want to go and find out what is the most competitive salary rates for what it is that I'm going to be seeking to put on this project. Okay. Um, or you may, my favorite of all, you may want to impact your GNA rate with the fact that you're going to win something new, big and different which means that you get to lower your GNA rate. I love that part. So there's a lot to be done. And I just gave you four or five that are right off the top of my head, some of my favorites. Let me ask, um, you know, the, the good thing about, uh, one thing that you may not know about me is I'm still very active uh, in pursuing contracts. And good. Uh, we are actually in a negotiation now with a agency and uh, it's a substantial project. It's, it's over 10 million. And uh, the part of the information that they shared with us when it, we looked at it, and I, I think it was an error. You know, like they, when they shared us with all their files, we saw some of their original estimates. And I don't know if it's error. I mean, they could have done it on purpose. Who knows? But either way, it came back. Uh, when we looked at their, their original estimate, right, um, their numbers were, were from 2010. Oh, my God. So how so, is it that if we had not seen that, we could not have pointed out what were the differences that they had missed? Right. And, and you were so, fortunate, right? You know, we, yeah, we were fortunate that we were able to, to, to point out some of the major differences. And because one was like, for example, on this estimate, uh, their concrete price came in from 2010. Well, concrete in 2010 was a lot oh cheaper. God. It was a third of the cost it is in 2022. Right, right. Um, and also, so how do you how do you handle that? What would you recommend to someone who's who's is you know, hey, look, I've got a handle on this project. I know this, but there's something wrong with the, on the government side, you know. Mm -hmm. And again, I happen to learn that, and you know, and I teach my team members, hey, if the, just because the government says it's whatever five to ten million, and you come up with twelve million, that doesn't mean you're wrong. Um, right. In my life experiences, I've found that the government is, is likely wrong just because of who estimated it, how it was done, but you just don't get a chance to see the government's estimate to know how you can value engineer it or right. how you can show the differences between what they miss and what uh, they're asking for. Okay. So the best way to do that, let's talk about that for just a minute. Okay. Because in your ability to, to write to how you estimated things. It's very important to have your documentation, number one, all right, that papers your audit file, so to speak. And it's very important to demonstrate to the government where your estimates came from and how they came about. 
so that when they read your 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 pricing and your cost volume, they're reading where they may have gone wrong, Eric. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about that. So if you've got concrete estimates that in 2022 cost, you know, way two and a half times more, or God only knows how much more. If you are, are it went from a, eighty dollar eighty a square yard uh, to one hundred and eighty a yard. So it's more than doubled. Okay? Yeah, it's almost tripled. More than doubled. Yeah, it's two and a half tripled. times. Yeah. So then you can demonstrate to them. Now you may not even know that it, that they no. did it based on eighty dollars, right? No. You may not have that information. But if you are talking to your government economic buyer ahead of time, presumably you're having that conversation. You may not get the numbers, but you are bringing forth the kind of information that maybe they need to, shall I say, fine tune their government independent cost estimate. But if not, and you're trying to justify, if you will, the the cost realism, why not give them the basis for your estimate today? And, and instead of having an attitude of, well, they didn't ask me for it, I'm not going to give it to them. Think, turn that around 180 degrees and say, I'm going to tell them why my numbers are realistic. Not only why, but here, let me show you a table that gives you that information. I have XYZ vendor. This is the quote I got from them. Here is the other two vendors that I have and the quotes I got from them. And we chose the least expensive of the three and look at what we got. And then they can sit up and take notice that $80, a, a, you know, a square or a cubic foot doesn't make any sense. Okay. Then they can go, aha, maybe we're wrong. And maybe contractor A is right. And if you're the only contractor, Eric, that does that, right? You just won a whole bunch of points with that government buyer, didn't you? Because you showed them what you did. Mm. I love that part. So I you think that, that we should do that? Um even in, you know, even when we've all, when we're in a competitive situation, you think we should still should do that or, or when we're just, or when we're in the negotiation? No, you should be doing it in defending the price that you submitted okay. to the government. Okay. Yeah. It's a competitive situation because after all, you're trying to demonstrate how smart you are and, and why your number is the right number. If, if your competitor comes in at $80 and they didn't do their homework, didn't go get three bids or didn't didn't go and do their research. Right. Right. Ultimately, they're going to look like they were not realistic. Sure. OK, so you're trying to show how smart you are. Really, right. that right. what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? That's good every day of the week. <laughs> no, that's, that's excellent. I love it. I love it. So tell us what other what other, uh, you know, we talked about pricing. Um, right. Tell me about, you know, you said it ties in other areas like cost accounting. Uh, right. Tell me some other things where people where you see people, like small businesses having challenges. Well, I'd say the small business are having challenges because let, let me just give you a, a, something that I've run up against uh, enough every year. And that is that a small business will say, oh, gee, I've, I get to get up to, to bat with this new prime contract. And we we've got the the subcontractor locked in and they're the incumbent and we're sure to win. And I go, talk to me a little bit more about it. Well, you come to find out that maybe they're going to pass through all of the subcontract costs, right? No mm -hmm. load on it whatsoever. Uh, or, or, or they're, they're not going to be doing anything themselves or very little themselves. Right. Sure. That's a mistake. Cause all that really does, Eric, is it bolster bolsters your revenue stream but it doesn't help you as a company develop the people, help your indirect rate structure, doesn't help you with your G&A very, very much, if at all. And it certainly isn't going to make you more competitive. Mm -hmm. So all it's doing is you're kind of being, if you will, like a, a cow, you know, you're getting milked. Mm. <laughs> you're getting milk <laughs> so what would you suggest that they do in that situation i mean well what i suggest that they do is is decide well, how about that, this let's say this we're going to speak a gestalt what would you do in that situation i wouldn't bid it oh you wouldn't bid i it? would i wouldn't i wouldn't get up to bat i'd say wait a minute if this government customer is not willing to allow us to develop some of our own people 
for the project, it's a no go. Mm. If it doesn't enhance a new, uh, you know, small business contractor to develop, because that's what we want. Right. We want these Absolutely. small businesses to grow and develop. Right. We need that. We right. Need Absolutely. And and if they can't develop their own people and their own talent, why are you going after it? You're just being a front for somebody. And that's just, in my opinion, that's just wrong. Mm. I wouldn't go after it. Say, just say no, thank you. You know, um, and listening to you speak, it sounds to me that the companies that do that or have done it, they're the ones that when they finish up with like their 8A, they end up out of business because they never develop themselves. They don't have anything. They right. haven't got any they talent to show for it. Yeah. You know, yes, they generated revenue. Yes, they got some profit out of it. But it was only for that period of time that they were in that program. Right. Well, how does that help you sustain and be an ongoing, op- you know, operation? It doesn't. Nice. Oh, I like it. All right, Marsha. Not- Keep going. Keep it going. I like. Well, the- and I'm and I'm really tough about that. I probably at least once a week, I will say to uh, a client, why are you bidding that? Tell me why you want to win this, because it doesn't seem like it's good for your company. And I can tell you more times than not, they should just say no. They should just move on to something else where they have a better probability of winning and they have a better probability of developing their own talent and their own company. OK. And, and I'm passionate about small businesses doing the things that that develop them as a viable contractor long after they're in the situation that they're in right now. So if I'm a, a lighting company, I shouldn't pursue a janitorial contract. Oh, please not. <laughs> it's talk about commodities. They're, that's the other thing is that a lot of these companies are, are pushing their commodities or they're in commodity pricing. And as soon as you are in that environment, you are talking about low price Price every single time race to the bottom. Okay. And that's not good for, that's not good for companies. It's not good for growth. So uh, if you, if you are, if your client was a lighting company, what should they be, I guess, focusing on what, what area you said you, Mm. So this, should they be focused on the actual installation part as opposed to just providing the commodity, like the actual light bulbs or the lights themselves? What do you think? Well, they it's, it's kind of hard for me because marketing is not really my main uh, thing, you sure. know, but I would look to be getting on to some major programs where you're a subcontractor to a large business where you have the only answer mm. to what they need. OK, you got to look for ways for you to be unique. That's what I like to tell small businesses. What are you going to do differently from everybody else? You know. No, keep going. Keep going, Marsha. I, no, I, I because here's the thing. If you're same as the next guy on the block and you're same as the guy who's in the next town, then what's going to differentiate you from from one another? You've got to find something that you can do differently with the tools that you're talking about and the talents you're talking about that nobody else can do. Nobody else can do. And one of our Facebook groups, one of the students posted um, that he was trying to bid something. And when he called, reached out to the manufacturer, obviously had to be a product, right? Commodities. Mm-hmm. That they asked him, who was he bidding it to? So he felt threatened. But it goes back to what you just said. I mean, I was thinking to myself, why are you threatened? You don't make the product. You don't own the product. So what? <laughs> so, so what are you doing with the product? If right. you're doing something different with the product and you're adding value no. to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was taking a product, buying from this guy and wanting to sell it to this guy. And he was concerned yeah. that they were going to find out. And I go, this is public information. It's not. Of course it is. It, uh, was it, a, so you don't have a viable, you're not creating a viable business strategy. No, you got you got to do something that's different for you as a company to set you apart from everybody else. OK. Have Otherwise, you, you're going to it's going to be plain vanilla. How does how does one find those things, Marsha? I mean, that what you've seen in the past from some of your stories of people that you've helped and supported. Well, I, I don't stay. I don't spend time finding opportunities. It's not my my jam. OK, mm-hmm. um, once people identify what they're going after, that's when I jump in and begin to help them. 
Okay. So it's not my thing to 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 go after finding those kinds. No, of but things. have you seen where someone's maybe pivoted in the past? Like one of your clients have pivoted, uh, and they and like you said, they were listening to you, and you said, "Hey guys, you're not adding any value by doing this. Go find some place where you could be unique and add value." And you saw them pivot. I have seen uh, clients who do not take product but do services. That's easier to pivot when it's services because you can hire the kind of talent that makes you unique, right, and different, yeah. and put some added value there. When you're in the services market, you stand a better chance of adding more value. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So now tell us about the type of clients that you like to work with. Oh, man. <laughs> you, gotta have, I, you have to have a client that you like, you know, ideal. I do. Profile type, right? I, I don't do. want everyone reaching out and, and bombarding you and they don't fit your profile type. So what kind no, of? No, actually, most of my clients that are my favorites tend to be in the 10 to $20 million range in okay. revenues every year. Um, they do technology or they do something unique. Okay. They, and it can be anything. Okay. It could be, you know, and, and most of them are services, admittedly. OK, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them will sell to DOD, uh, FAA, well, uh, or and many agencies in DOD, NASA. Much of what I tend to see agency specific, it doesn't matter to me, but they are doing something unique and different. OK, that they don't have a lot of competitors for. Right. And they're going after something and they want to win it and they want to be different. They want to be different than their competitors. And a lot of times I'll say to them, we have to find out more information up front, back to that early involvement thing I was talking about. We need to find out what uh, the, the competition is doing. We need to find out what the price to win is. And I don't do price to win. I do have colleagues that do price to win. And we go get that information and it allows us to know the target range of what the government is likely to pay for that. So to answer your question, my favorite clients are small businesses. I love small businesses. I get to work with the owners, right? Maybe they, they've got people on staff who do some pricing, or maybe they've had somebody who, um, shall I say, they've, they've offloaded their pricing maybe to somebody who's not, not really their mainstream thing of what they do. Maybe it's their bookkeeper. Maybe it's their CFO. Uh, somebody like that who really doesn't know the nuances and subtleties. So I'm going to take those nuances and subtleties that we need to look at and do something different. You know, sometimes it's working with indirect rates. Sometimes it's working with a lot of the other things that I talk about in my book. Yes. Uh, but I do love small businesses. They're my favorite people. So you said that you don't handle the price to win. Tell people out here, what does price to win mean? Price to win means that there it's a specialty that is usually done by, in a small business, it's outsourced. You find uh, the right consultant who that's all they do. They do price to win. They find out what the government range is going to be for that procurement, for, uh, for what they want, what the price range will be for providing the answer to what the government is asking right. for, okay? And it's not a specific number. It's usually a range. If someone gives you a specific number, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, they may also do competitive assessment to give you some idea of what your competitors will likely do to get to that price to win. What are the things that they will, shall I say, play with in order to get there? And so with some of that information, we can make some important decisions inside the company of what we need to do. But knowing the price to win is very important. Okay. And you have people that you can recommend for that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. In larger companies, that piece is, is usually done by one particular department. And it does not usually, it's not the same people who do the pricing. Those two need to be separated, just like I don't do price to win. It's a conflict of interest because I'm going to get at competitive information. Right. I shouldn't be sharing that. Uh, uh. And the people who do that inside a big company, well, they may bleed a little bit into one another, but they're inside the same tent, right. so to right, speak. Right, right, right. 
Right. Right. So the, so the, I mean, it's almost like a, uh, uh, it sounds like to me, it describes like an independent party that's yes. Up, right. And so, which, which makes sense because uh, even like what I was mentioning to you before, when we saw the number, like we didn't want to use the numbers to estimate the price because right. otherwise we wouldn't have learned what it would take to get the job done. Right. Absolutely. So we, so we want to come up with that independently and then go back in and say, okay, well, what was, how do we, how, why are we so far off? Right. And where, right. what happened? And then that's how we learned, right. What, you know, there was right. where there were some design issues that mm. um, the, 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 the designs uh, was a, like a preliminary design. Let's say it was like a schematic, design. Right. but when he sat that particular design in this particular area, uh, there was additional uh, site work that needed to be done in order to make that design work. Well, that wasn't accounted for in See? the original pricing that the government had done. Right. So you find out sometimes that there's information when you're talking about price to win. Maybe you find out some of that right. information right? and you're able to address it in your pricing. You're able right. to bolster what it is that you're submitting to the government so that you have a good story and that you have a good uh, support for what you've done and why you've done it. Absolutely. Uh, you also mentioned, okay, I'm looking here on your website, cost accounting and government contracting audits. Yep. And most of those tend to be either accounting system audit. So if a small contractor doesn't have an accounting system that would be compliant for government contracting, um, then we would help get that particular client there. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. That's, that's one I guess, thing. That's, oh, that's great. Um, who, at what level do I need to, to have that done? At what well, level? It revenue amount? It, it's not necessarily a revenue amount. It tends to be what kind of contracts you're going after. Okay. I'll tell you, as soon as you are going after a cost plus contract, you'd better be making the switch over to uh, an accounting system that can handle cost plus. Um, a lot of contractors will limp along, shall I say, with a, with a, um, unsophisticated accounting system until they have to. So it's not a dollar thing. Uh, it's really kind of what types of contracts you're going after. So that's one type of an, an audit we may prepare for. We could prepare for a pre-award audit where DCA may come in and take a look at not only the system, but maybe take a look at the bid numbers. Uh, we may take a look at an estimating system audit. We're seeing a lot more of that lately, Eric, where the government is coming in, usually bigger contractor, medium-sized contractor, probably 50 million and above. Um, that's not necessarily a, a rule, but but generally they want to see how the uh, estimating systems inside the company work. That's not only the system, but it's the policies and procedures, the practices, and the people. What do the people do? It's very comprehensive. Okay, very very comprehensive. Are there any um, accounting systems uh, when you're doing cost plus that you like that you can say? <laughs> As you well, said, you know, we got to do a cost plus accounting system. So you said unsophisticated. So what would be an example of a sophisticated accounting system? Well, let me say this. Um, and I'm not picking on on software. OK, oh. let me let me say that. Um, but typically contractors that start out with QuickBooks are do very, very fine if they're not doing cost plus work. As soon as they have to cross over, they need to get a little bit more sophisticated. Some of those could be something like a SIMPAC system or a Uninet. I don't believe that small contractors ought to take on installing something like a Deltec system. It's very mm -hmm. expensive, very, very cumbersome, very costly. Or an Oracle, for God's sakes. Um, NetSuite is a great Great product for financial accounting, but not for government contracting. Right. I don't have a favorite. I usually let um, my clients take a look at three or four and then interview them and find out what suits them, both for their pocketbook and for their application. And, and knowing that there's going to be an installation part of it. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's not a simple answer, Eric. No, never it is. But we, you know, we want to give people, I like to give people direction. 
Right, right. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I gotcha. don't, I, I'm just, I'm the kind of guy, you know, like I said, I just want to give people some direction just because uh, I can tell you like my experiences and even trying to create, you know, websites and web pages, there's like five different platforms, right? I'm like, okay, well, somewhere- sure. Hey, you're the expert. Tell me something. Yeah, give me a, give me a hint. Like so, you know, it doesn't right. help me with the experts as well. You know, you can pick any of the webs. I mean, so I, I like things that you're familiar with that you've worked with in the past that you've known. Right. That you've used. Right. That's all. Right. Uh, right. 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 So. And I've had clients that have used some of those successfully and some of them not so successfully. So it depends on the contractor. Depends on the time that they have. It depends on the pocketbook. It depends on a lot of different things. And it should never be up to somebody like me to tell them what to do. No, never. 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 I agree. Never. I agree with that. I, I agree totally. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I have never spent as much time talking about pricing before. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about pricing. I could talk about pricing all day long. I love yeah. it. I live, breathe, and eat it, you know? Yeah. Well, let's 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 change the subject. Let's talk about something else sure. a little more fun. Sure. You know. Okay. Uh, okay. So tell me your a last or recent purchase that you made on Amazon. Oh my God! I just bought a uh, tea. I love tea. You know. Hey, there you go. I That's bought tea. Good. What kind of tea I, did you buy? I bought decaf or old gray tea. That's kind of my favorite. Decaf or old gray. Yeah, that's that's one of my go tos. Okay. It really, really is. I just bought that this morning. I'm like, OK, I'm down to four tea bags. That's not OK. <laughs> It'll be here tomorrow. I love that. Part. There you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. No, yeah. uh, that's good. That's good. Tell me an odd place that you worked at or a job that no one might never guess. Oh, my God. OK, here's one. Right. I sold pots and pans door to door when I was a freshman in college. Oh, no. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Wow. That's and I can cool. remember demonstrating how strong the pots and pans were because I could stand them on their edge and I could stand on them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. That, that was, was, that that was, was fun for you? Was it fun? It was fun. It was a lot of work. It was hot. You had to cart a whole suitcase full of pots and pans. Where, where, where were you? Uh, where'd you go to college? I went to the American University in Washington, D.C. Okay, so. okay, all right. So you were originally from the D.C. area? No, I originally came from New York and uh, went to D.C. to go to college at the American University. So Okay, and you're located, now you're in, based out of where? Out of Phoenix. Okay, okay. How'd you get to yeah. Phoenix? Uh, by car. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> by car. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, I love it. I love yeah, it. I lived in D.C. for 37 years and I loved it. But I remember D.C. from a long time ago when it was very different than it is today. So I and when I think of D.C., that's what I think about. I don't think of it as D.C. as I see it today. Mm. So I want to keep that. So I, I do keep that memory in your head. OK, I'm going to keep that memory in my head. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Funny. Early riser or burning midnight oil? No, I'm an early riser. Okay. okay. No, no. By nine o'clock, I'm toast. 9 p.m., I'm toast. Because okay. I'm up at, in the summertime, I'm up by four. Uh, in the wintertime, maybe 6.30. So, and it varies in between there as the seasons change. But I'm up pretty much before the light, you know, before the sun rises. If you weren't doing this, is it, what do you think you might be doing? See, I don't know the answer to that question Ooh. because I love doing what I do. Uh, but I probably would be, um, I'd be working with dogs somehow, okay? I'd be training dogs somehow, okay? Um, and I'd probably be training dogs and veterans because those two sort of come together for me, you know? So I think that when I stop doing what I'm doing, whenever the hell that is, then I'm going to probably be working with dogs and veterans. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, uh, we're going to be respectful of your time. Why don't you okay. say some uh, final words for small businesses out there? Well, I tell you, I love small businesses. I love their spirit. I love the entrepreneurial approach because there's somebody who is putting their life on the line. 
Okay. It's like going to war. They're literally putting themselves right out there in front, in front of their customer, putting their money into it. It means a lot to me to do that. Um, and that's what I love about small businesses. I, and I love that they're doing things that are new and different that big businesses can't do. They operate like a gazelle. They don't operate like an elephant. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. And as always, we're going to have all the show notes from today's episode on our website, govconjice.com forward slash podcast. We'll have the link to Marsha's book, uh, wherever you can buy that from. So we'll have that link to the episode as well. So uh, I want to thank everyone listening today. Marsha, thank you so much for coming on. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Marsha. Thank you.